I'm going to uh, talk to you today about tailoring diets to your gut microbiome. When we talk about the gut microbiome, people tend to realize that everyone's microbiome is different. But we want to see if uh, saying that is true, but we want to see if we can group the microbiome together in useful ways that have some sort of predictive ability uh, for what the function of that microbiome is going to be or how it's going to react to certain diets or drugs or diseases. So one of the attempts that's been made to uh, characterize the gut microbiome and group people together based on their microbiome is this, uh, what I'm showing you here, concept of enterotypes. So essentially, you condense, this is just a graph that condenses everyone's whole microbiome down into a single point. And based on similarities to one another, you group them together on this uh, figure here. And one of the earlier uh, attempts at this found that people could be grouped together into three sort of enterotypes, they called them each dominated by uh, a different characteristics group of species. And so we had a Bacteroides dominated one, a Prevotella dominated one, and a Rumococcus dominated one. Now, as people have studied this more and more, they've seen that uh, this concept, while it might be useful, these exact enterotypes haven't seemed to be entirely reproducible. That Rumococcus one uh, doesn't always get detected. Uh, and it seems more that the Bacteroides and Prevotella are now more uh, of a continuum where you have more of one versus the other. And so you talk now about the Bacteroides and Prevotella ratio. Okay, so it, and people have seen that this is predictive for certain things such as how you respond to certain diets, for instance. Um, but one of the things my lab is interested in is can we look at the gut microbiome in different ways and group people together in a bit more of a specific manner. Uh, and so specifically we look at uh, how they respond to certain dietary fibers. So we're particularly interested in resistant starch. Um, so this is, if you've not heard of it, it's sort of a starch that acts more like a dietary fiber. So uh, we have enzymes in our saliva, in our pancreas, that are able to break down sort of the regular starches in our diet. But there's certain starches that don't get broken down by those human enzymes for a variety of reasons that I won't get into here. But essentially what happens is that it makes its way through to the colon because it doesn't get broken down by those human enzymes earlier in the intestinal tract and gets fermented by bacteria there. And there's certain bacteria uh, that we call resistant starch grading bacteria that are able to break down that resistant starch. Most bacteria are like the human enzymes, can't break it down. They can handle the regular starches, but not these resistant starches. But there are certain species that can. Now, when you feed people resistant starch, one of the hopeful end goals is that you get an increase in butyrate production by the gut microbiome. And we care about butyrate because it has a lot of health benefits. Uh, it's associated with lower cancer rates. Uh, it's anti-inflammatory, helps maintain a strong gut barrier, and a number of other functions as well. So we're hoping to get increased butyrate production when we feed people this resistant starch. And it's one of the best fibers that have been found for increasing resistant starch. But that's on average. If you look at people on an individual by individual basis, you'll see that certain people, so if we look at here in the orange, uh, those are the people that got a significant increase in their butyrate levels. You can also have people in the blue who didn't get a big increase, but they already had pretty high butyrate levels to begin with. And then we have the people down in the black. And these are the people that started with low butyrate, ate the resistant starch, and their butyrate levels didn't go up. So we're pretty interested in those type of people. Why don't they get this increased butyrate response? And so we believe it has to do with what their microbiome looked like at the beginning of when they started consuming that resistant starch. So we've done uh, a couple of different things. One is that we have performed uh, in vitro studies, essentially where we take fecal samples from a number of different people and then do uh, in vitro fermentations, adding different types of resistant starch and seeing what happens. So here, the, the size of these uh, dots here shows how much butyrate they got, how much their butyrate increased uh, when that 
in vitro fermentation was performed with that resistant starch. And so we can see it's quite variable from person to person. So each one along the x-axis there is a different person. And we can see, one, we have our banana starch, for reasons that we don't fully understand, was pretty much universal in getting higher butyrate levels. But for all the other ones, it was variable between people which ones got those good responses. And so now we're trying to figure out why we get a response to one versus another. We've also done this in human clinical trials as well. So this is also a phenomenon that we do see in people. Uh, in this case, we can't look at as quite a wide variety of resistant starches. But here we have a crossover trial with three different types of resistant starch. And we see what happens to that person's microbiome each time they consume a different resistant starch. So you can see here, this person, number five there, had really great responses to uh, the potato starch and this HAM4, which is a type of uh, high amylose corn starch, but not so much to the other one. And we see different patterns going across these different people. And so it's very similar to what we saw in those in vitro studies. So we really want to understand what's going on in these microbiomes that lead to these variability in uh, butyrate changes. So we, when we look at the gut microbiome, we can do it in a couple of different ways. We can look at uh, what are the predictive factors in that sort of initial microbiome that determines whether you get that higher butyrate response or not. So uh, in this case, what we're showing is ones on the right were more prevalent in uh, microbiomes that produce low butyrate, and ones on the left in the red are ones that produced, uh, that were present at higher abundances in people that produce higher levels of butyrate. And this is all for uh, potato starch. And so what we see is, uh, if you look at this for each of those different starches, you can see different patterns uh, of which bacteria were sort of favorable for getting butyrate from one of these resistant starches versus another. One of the really interesting things here is for the potato starch, uh, the top one up here in the green that was associated with low butyrate was Bifidobacterium adolescentis. And so immediately as you hear a Bifidobacterium, uh, you think maybe sort of like a probiotic type organism, and indeed adolescentis is used as a probiotic in some cases. It's actually also one of the two organisms in the gut that we know are able to break down resistant starch. So it's this one and Ruminococcus bromii are really the only two that we know have the enzymatic machinery to break this down. So it was very interesting that we saw that this one was associated, when you have high levels of this, it was associated with low levels of butyrate from, from uh, potato starch. And so it turns out that for the ones uh, that had a good response to many of the starches in our study, it was the other uh, organism, Ruminococcus bromii, that was associated with those samples. And so it seems that uh, at least in the studies that we've done so far, uh, that the Bifidobacterium adolescentis was overall associated with lower butyrate levels. There were a couple of uh, exceptions. Uh, they, we had a tapioca resistant starch for which when you had high adolescentis, it did lead to high butyrate levels. So it wasn't quite universal, but it does suggest that we can't assume that this otherwise assumed to be beneficial organism is going to be beneficial in all cases. And so what can we conclude from this? Well, we already knew that everyone's microbiome was different. But there's been a lot of thought that there's a lot of functional redundancy between gut microbiomes. Uh, and, and that's true. But it does matter who's performing that function. So we have this Bifidobacterium adolescentis, Ruminococcus bromii. Both would be performing this function of being resistant starch degrading bacteria. And so there's that functional overlap if you have one versus the other. And a lot of people actually have both. But which one's dominant is going to determine some of these outcomes from consuming these resistant starches. And so we're kind of going on, on our way to building a model of being able to predict, based on your gut microbiome, which of these resistant starches would give, be most likely to give you a beneficial uh, butyrate response. And so I just wanted to thank a few people that had performed some of this work. Uh, June Teichman, Peter DiMartino, and Tara Pickens, who are my graduate students. Uh, this is all work that's funded by the American Heart Association and uh, Penn State University, 
has been very supporting as well. Thank you very much.